like to open it up for questions. Um, great presentation, Sunil. Thank you. Two questions. Um, number one, you talked about climate change, and when we talk about um, climate change, it's great to talk about global and everything. What's going to be the impact locally around here on the farmers and that type of thing? That's question number one. And question number two, I think it was 83% between coal, gas, from Abbott Power Plant and the electricity that was generated by Ammer and IP, which mainly coal and I guess some nuclear yeah. coming in on that. Are you proposing to substitute natural gas for coal? And what is the equivalency of CO2 emissions from that? I realize the mining is different and, and that type of thing, and the, but the equivalency from that. And are you looking at biomass substitution for some of that and coming in there also? Um, I'm, not ultra familiar, I'm not particularly familiar on the local impacts of climate change here. The picture that I am most familiar with is something is from some work that Don Wobbles has done, that if we continue on our current emissions trajectory, Illinois by 2100 will have climatic conditions similar to East Texas. Now, I don't know how many people are familiar with climatic conditions from East Texas, but I don't really want them here, even though I complain about the cold snap that we're going through. Um, the impact beyond that, I mean, it's not just about the weather. Um, the trees that we have in Urbana-Champaign are not designed to grow um, in climatic conditions in East Texas. They're all going to die. The crops that we grow right now, we're dependent on, like, we don't irrigate. Um, we're lucky in that. Like, we have exceptional soil and we don't have to irrigate. We can grow things really, really easily. If the temperatures rise to where they are in East Texas, it's going to be much more difficult to grow corn out here. Um, and we are probably going to have to start irrigating in the summer. If we, start, if we get into that, the stresses that we'll place on the Mahomet Aquifer um, are going to be an order of magnitude beyond what they are right now if we get into the business of irrigating crops over here. So there is definitely a lot that we will see. We don't have to worry about sea level rise here. Um, but the overall impacts, and part of one of the scariest things is we don't really know. We don't really know everything that could go wrong. We just know that the situation is getting worse and we've got our feet on the gas pedal. Um, with regards to coal and natural gas, this campus uses about 30%, 30, 35% of on-campus combustion from coal. The rest is natural gas. Um, switching all of what we use on campus to natural gas would cut our emissions by roughly about 10%. It would, uh, it would reduce about 36, 000, uh, about 50, 60,000 tons or so of CO2. I've done the math, but I don't have it with me over here. Um, and that's partly, that's basically centered around natural gas has a little over half the emissions for output fuel energy for coal. I think around 55% or so. Um, I don't know to what degree that accounts for upstream emissions, like um, there is uh, methane emissions associated with natural gas extraction that probably isn't in that figure and could be driving that up. But in terms of the actual combustion, it's about 55%. Next question. So, um I read recently that there's a huge, um, pretty well-known disparity between um, the acceptance of the idea of climate change in actual climate scientists versus the general public, something like 97% of actively publishing scientists versus around 55% of the general public. Is there a statistic for um, the awareness of the issue of students and faculty on campus? No, not that I know of. Um, I would say... The awareness, uh, like you have a strong level of interest in sustainability on campus, you don't necessarily have much of the corresponding knowledge base that goes along with it, which is partly why you have so much desire to work on recycling, or so much desire to do things like 
let's audit the number of lights on campus. Um, which, when you really look at what we need to do on campus, it's really centered around capital investment. It's really centered around the fact that we need to invest on the order of 150 to 250 million dollars in our buildings. And these are investments with good return on, like with good returns, better than the foundation has had. Um, you're talking, um, well, uh, in general, uh, you're talking about 10 year paybacks for most of the things that you could do in the energy conservation realm, especially with rising energy prices. But the awareness about that, about the scope that it represents, about you know, what's really going on in our buildings, is just not there. I mean, most people on campus don't even probably have no idea that we use reheat in most of our buildings. We cool buildings down, like air temperatures below what they need to be, and then we heat them back up again. Um, and we can do, and we used to do that because, hey, we have all this extra steam that's coming out from Abbott Power Plant. We didn't use it all before. Now that we do, now that we worry about how much our energy bills are, that matters. But now we have all of those old systems in place that really should be retrofitted with something better. Um, I will comment on one other study that I saw that was somewhat amusing um, in class a couple of weeks ago about public awareness of climate change, which was basically that women had a better understanding of climate change, but men thought that they did, which is probably not surprising to anyone. <laughs> Next question. 